great to have you all here. Uh, okay, so let's start our presentation. So my name is Barbara, and I'm a technical writer. I work for the Kima project. I've been with Kima for like over a year right now. In my spare time, um, I love tray running, and of course, going into some more details about documentation and documentation tools. And this is Tom. Yeah, hi, I'm Tom, and I've been with the project as well for the last year and a half. Uh, the open source project Kima. Uh, I also like to develop some musical ideas in my free time, but today we're not going to talk about that. We're going to focus on documentation code, the open source, all the rage. So let's have a quick look of uh, what's in this presentation for you. What topics are we going to uh, talk about? So we are going first to uh, tell you a little bit of, uh, this is just a brief overview of documenting for the open source world. Uh, we are going to show you how we do things in our project, in Project Kima. Uh, then we'll have a look at the hows and whys. Why should you do it? And why is it beneficial to treat your uh, docs as code? And then we are going to have a look at us, the technical writers, uh, as developers, but not your regular developers, but information developers. And if it works, and how does it work? Let me spoil that a little bit. It does work, and we'll show you how. So let's start with this logo that all of you should and probably know here so the open source software all the rage right now uh, just a quick check how many of you guys do actually work in open source projects raise your hands please okay cool so um, many things we are going to talk about here might not be very new to you but i guess it's cool to hear that some people are as other people are having the same experiences or similar experiences as you do. Um, so when people talk about the open source, uh, I think that it's safe to assume that mostly the association is open source, the code of the software, right? But uh, what about the documentation? What if you took, uh, what if you take all of the uh, principles and the ideas behind open source? So the openness, the collaboration, uh, the fact that anybody can uh, contribute to the code base. What if you take these principles and apply them to the documentation of the project and as uh, you've uh, proven us there are many of you who already work in open source projects uh, so this might not be something new to you but believe me there are still projects and companies which have their documentation separate separate from their code and uh, relationships between groups of people that work on the documentation and the groups of people that work on the code are not these of openness and collaboration but they resemble sometimes, I'd say, hmm, these gang relationships between uh, rival gangs in West Side Story. Uh, so we worked in such an environment before uh, Kima started as an open source project. And, and when we were given the opportunity to uh, move uh, our documentation closer to the code and to the developers and ourselves a little bit closer to the development process and to being real developers, we jumped on this uh, idea without much hesitation. And our company, I don't know if they realized that, but they helped us a little bit in making that push because on our employment papers at SAP, because this is an SAP uh, project, uh, we are called the information developers. So that gave us a little bit uh, of inspiration. And I mentioned the project, project name uh, quite a few times already. Uh, let me show you <laughs> here in, in bigger font. So it's Kima, and it sounds foreign, right? Spanish, uh, Italian maybe, foreign. So I'm going to spill the beans and tell you that Kima is a Greek name, and in Greek, uh, Kima is a wave. And uh, this name was chosen for our project because we wanted to be on the same boat. And yes, it's a pun, it's a terrible one, but <laughs> stick with me. Uh, as some other major players in that uh, whole area. So uh, other projects that we look up to and that we work with that share this maritime Greek uh, name scheme, I'm just gonna just name two of them. One of them is Kubernetes, which in Greek is a captain. And the other one uh, I want to mention is Istio, which in Greek is uh, a sale. So what uh, does a technical writer do when he or she, uh, when they want to prepare themselves for the inevitable come of the, uh, coming of the open source? Um, we thought to ourselves, well, uh, we have to prepare some guidelines. 
And uh, there, of course, there, as you probably know, there are these customary documents in open source projects like uh, the project's main README, uh, the contributing guidelines, uh, but these are mostly, and the code of conduct, but these are mostly code oriented, right? So what about the documentation? From the very beginning, we knew that we wanted to allow people from the outside to uh, contribute to our documentation base. We didn't only want uh, this pro project to be uh, focused on code when it comes to external contributions. And when I say external, I mean not only external as complete strangers, so to say, but also external as in not only our core development team from within the company. And when you're preparing for that inevitable thing to come, uh, you have to prepare some, uh, some guidelines. Don't we all love them, right? But we, uh, knowing that uh, people from all around the world and from all around our company are going to be able to read those guidelines, we thought to ourselves, well, nobody's going to read them if they're long and if, if they're convoluted. So we made sure we made them clear, concise, and to the point, and uh, we created a completely separate, as you can see, uh, repository within our project to store all of these guidelines and these documents that help people contribute to our project. And we also render them on our website, just like the rest of our documentation. As a, and as you can see, uh, many areas are covered, from uh, the entire content strategy, which is uh, described here, to smaller things like uh, diagrams. Everybody has to know what colors they should use, right? Or how we do screenshots, how we do release notes, etc. So if anybody wants to jump and help us or show us that they, something needs documenting, they can check the guidelines and uh, get a better idea of where uh, the matters fit in. Also on the technical front, uh, I'm going to switch to the next slide, one slide further. Um, we uh, worked on two, two things. So the first one was the entire look and feel of our website, which we think of as the uh, main entry point when it comes to uh, consuming our documentation. So we had, a, of course, a dedicated development team that worked on the website, but we weren't passive. We uh, bounced ideas back and forth. We tested prototypes. We made sure that the user experience when it comes to the website is as documentation friendly as possible. And we are quite pleased with the results. I hope you are going to visit our uh, project website after the presentation. And then comes the more technical aspect of um, publishing the documentation. So this is basically the workflow. And when it comes to from the very conception of a document to having it uh, visible as our website, published as our website. So we write our documentation in Markdown, which is no stranger to, the, to most of you probably. It's a very easy um, thing to do. Everybody can learn in just a matter of minutes. Then we push our documentation to, uh, to our GitHub uh, project, uh, where we designed a, uh, a very uh, well-organized structure so that uh, we are sure that everybody knows where the documentation should go. There are no, uh, no asterisks or hidden paths there. Uh, then after you create a, a pull request with your documentation, which is, of course, another uh, typical GitHub thing, uh, rest, the rest hop happens automatically, as we like to say, uh, because our static site generator Gatsby is uh, notified uh, about the fact that, hey, there are changes in the documentation, please build a new version of our website. And so it does. But first, before you uh, merge the pull request, you are given the opportunity to review your changes in the context of the entire website. How uh, do your changes influence the look of the website, how does it look with all the styling, the CSSs, whatever. You can check if everything looks the way you expect it, expect it to look, and then when you are ready, you click Merge. Right? Sounds easy. I hope it is if you decide to contribute. Barbara, you shall take over now. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Tom has just told you a little bit uh, about the Kima story, so how uh, we work in open source, why we decided to do it, and what our documentation looks like also, and how we create it. So how it's all happening like on the, let's say, the technical side. So behind me there is the, the Kima website, so the, the docs that you see when you, uh, when you go to Kima. And um, I would like to add some more things about 
why we do it. Why do we pay so much attention to the dogs, right? So imagine you are looking for a solution that helps you to um, expand or extend your applications in a really easy way. So between your job and looking at pictures of funny cats, you encounter Kima, right? So you go in and the first thing you see is, well, documentation because you want to install it, you want to play with it, right? So that's why you go to docs. And in a, like, let's say, more standard approach, the documentation comes with a solution. So the company buys the solution and then there's the documentation that you use, right? To start it, to work with it, to enjoy it. So here, is it, this is a little bit um, on the other way around. So you first go into docs and then you play with the solution, let's say. So that's why we pay so much attention to it. So our documentation not only consists of the manuals, let's say, but we had also our Kima blog where you can find out more about what we are doing. We have our community that Tommy just mentioned uh, just a while um, ago, right? And then we've got our roadmap that you can also visit to see what is there in the future for us. So you, have, you, you see that there are a lot of details there that make you happy about it. And it's about the website encouraging you to just you know, start working with the project. So you can be either like, oh yes, I want to go further with that, or like, mm, I'm gonna look for something more, right? So that's why uh, we pay a lot of attention to it. Okay, so that's the, let's say, first part of our journey through um, technical writing world and um, here you learned a little bit about schema as I said and a little bit of documentation in our project. Let's go to technical writers as information, information developers. So I don't know how many of you work with technical writers. Anybody? Anybody? Yes, some of you are technical writers, I know that. And um, yeah, but to some people, technical writer, when, you, when they hear like, okay, technical writer, who is a technical writer? Okay, that's the guy who, well, writes something that is technical. Maybe he, like, is an editor or somebody similar to that. But in our words, technical writers are the people who look for the input. Take the input from a developer and then make beautiful docs out of it, right? So just. That's what, that's, what we, that's what we are looking for every day. For just good input, like give me, give me, give me, give me some input. And uh, yeah, but in our company, as Tom mentioned, uh, we are called information developers, and that's what we want to explore today. So how are technical writers the developers? In what way? How does the code, does the documentation as code approach helps us? Is it beneficial at all to technical writers and the teams? So let's start from docs as code approach. In Kima, it is very close. So we can see that it's like the docs and, and code are the very uh, two layers of the same Kima cake, let's say. And why is that? So first of all, documentation is kept in the same place, as we mentioned, as the code. So we keep it in the GitHub repository. We have our beautiful documentation structure in there, and we um, we just maintain it and make sure that it's always up to date. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we write for developers. So we are like more leaning towards the code than the, for example, UI experience, right? So that's the, that's the difference also. That's why we wanted to keep our docs even closer to the code. And thirdly, um, you cannot really get Kima without the code, without the, well, without the code obviously, <laughs> <laughs> but without the documentation. Because when you, you can all, of course like refrain and just not go to the website, but it's always there for you. It's in the Kima console, it's in GitHub, so it's like really part and parcel mm -hmm. of our project, right? So that's our Kima cake with uh, docs and code. And now, let's explore a little bit, the docs is called approach. How is it utilized? So it all starts with this bright idea. So we've got our requirements for our feature. Let's say we have this new Kima component. That's our feature, right? Developers think hard about the feature implementation and, um, and the 
and th there are the people that want to you know, contribute to the documentation as well. So we've got our code on one side and documentation on, on, uh, on, on the other side. And of course, there are obviously a lot of people that like to write documentation. Like, who enjoys writing documentation? There are people that like it. That's perfect. That's, I really, really, really appreciate that. But usually developers are like, mm, I don't really enjoy that. Let, maybe there are some other people that could help us with that. And these are our technical writers, right? So these are the people that help you. We work on the, yeah. So we work on the, on the side of documentation. So to like sum it up a little bit, we've got our code, we've got documentation, and we would like to follow the same process, right? So the journey starts. But it's not that complicated as this, right? It's really not complicated. It's not like take your ring to Mordor or anything like that. It all goes to one pull request. So for those who are familiar with GitHub, and I think that there are a lot of you, um, we create our documentation in the same way as developers create code. So if there is a technical writer working on his or her set of content, <coughs> just putting it into pull request, and then, of course, there are further stages that the pull request has to go through, but it's like the same way, right? So, after we've got our pull request with our content, there is this part that we call the review, because we have to ensure quality, right? So, we go through the review part, which is the same for the code and for the documentation, so we still follow the same rules. So if a technical writer writes something, there is always another technical writer that checks it. If the developers fancy some writing and wants to write some documentation and contribute to what we already have, then the, the technical writer is notified about that and can also review this readme file or whatever markdown file is there for him, right? So that's our review. Additionally, we've got our pipelines that we use to run tests against the pull request. So it's, again, the same process for code and for documentation. We've got, for example, pro jobs that help us to figure out if there are links that are dead links and we can just right away correct them, fix them, so that there is nothing, uh, nothing wrong with our docs, right? And here is our quality sign, so after creation, review, we can say, okay, fine, we can merge it right now. So that's the process, and the, so the, the key, let's say, takeaway right now is like, we follow really, really the same process, and we follow the same guidelines, and now I would like to show you also the pull request that we have. So this is the, the sample one, so you can see here that Technical writers and developers cooperate on this pull request from the very point of creation until it's tested and merged, right? So we've got like some small tests uh, at the bottom. There's some discu discussion going on in between, uh, some finger pointing, some, yeah. So this is how it looks like. It's the same. Um, and now let's explore the outcome, the benefits that it has for us as technical writers. And can technical writers really be somehow treated on the same level as developers? And how can they contribute as information developers, right? So first of all, there is this context of creating documentation, being close to the code. This, in turn, fosters the team effort put in our work as technical writers and as developers, right? So we work as a team. On the other hand, technical writers are not only the, just the people that write. We have many hats, so it's not really just about the writing. And of course, we contribute to the community as um, working hand in hand with, with the developers, right? So starting with the context, as technical writers, we really dive deeper into the context, let's say, on the same level as developers. And keeping the code so close to our documentation really helps, the, helps us to do so, right? So we are always in the loop. And this, in turn, also affects our work as team members. These are our developers excited to meet the writer. So it really, it really helps us to be on the same <coughs> team as the developers. 
There are some other solutions. I've also been working with a team of writers. So we were like on this content island, a little bit further away from the devs, uh, which of course can be also working well. I'm not saying that it's not, but in our, in our uh, situation, it's better to keep the devs close to us. Uh, so we can work together. We can be there as technical writers from the planning to the release of the feature, right? So we are going through the same processes with the same people and uh, cooperating, right? So this uh, also facilitates the mutual understanding between the team members and that's what Tom will tell you more about. Let me take over the clicker, the clicker and yes. To, yes, move to the next thing. Okay, so mutual understanding. Uh, Barbara mentioned these two models, the one that uh, we have in our project and the old one, the other one, so to say. So you can have either a, I mean, we work as either a separate uh, uh, documentation team of people who are dedicated to uh, working on this one thing, or we can just blend in with the devs. And uh, with Kima being an open source project and going open source, we decided that it's time to end this uh, division and uh, it's, stop, it's time to stop seeing the, uh, the developers as cavemen who uh, don't see any use for anybody who doesn't write code. And it's, it's a good time to uh, stop being embarrassed with everything uh, the developers write when it comes to our documentation. So. Uh, when we are at the center of the development cycle, we see the features as they are conceptualized, as they are tested, as their first POCs. Some features, of course, uh, get discarded and we can be sad with the teams, um, with the developers, I mean. Uh, and it doesn't really take that long to, you know, us to understand the developers and the developers to understand us. Uh, being uh, in the very, at the very center of the development cycles, cycle, we can teach the developers a lot and show them that we are worth a lot as team members. For example, uh, remember these guidelines that we created uh, thinking about external contributions. Well, one of the major uh, group of external contributors for us when it comes to the documentation is the group of the developers. Uh, instead of doing everything for them, uh, more often than not we are able to educate them and to let them know, hey, you're adding this to this, then maybe you should write about it in our documentation. Here, look at the guidelines, look at the doc structure, makes sense, right? And after a few times, the devs are able to, uh, that's wind, that's not a bomb shelter alarm or anything, don't worry. And so uh, after a few times, the devs, uh, they start to write docs on their own and there's much, there's less for, to do uh, for us on our own and we, you know, become uh, one, so to say. We also have the opportunity to help to coach them a little bit when it comes to their language skills. We can help them develop their uh, simplified English skills because, you know, writing in simplified English, which is very good for technical documentation, is not something that everybody is born with. You have to train that, you have to work on that. We have to work on that a lot. And also uh, our project, which is uh, mostly not a uh, natively English speaking team, all of us can benefit from uh, polishing up the English a little bit and we try to help the devs with that. So they see the benefits, they see that we are not only these uh, pesky spell checkers and these grammar Nazis, that we are not always asking questions and demanding that they explain things to us. We can also share our knowledge, our expertise with them, but in a little bit of a different field. So there's this mutual understanding that's based on the fact that we both uh, mean the, us, the technical writers and the devs, that we are both experts just in different fields. And uh, we try to uh, instill the passion for having clear documentation uh, for the things they develop. And it, it is a great thing to have because sometimes after talking to us, the developers decide, for example, that maybe it's a good idea to expand on the error messaging because you, know, you don't want something like this to happen in your project in your product because who's going to, going to understand that, right? And uh, we are basically the closest thing they get uh, to an end user without getting out of the office, without getting out of the project. We don't really know that much about the de details of the implementation. So when they 
talk with us about the different things that they implement, we can give them feedback that is much closer to real world rather than peer review that happens on, on pull requests. So that's one thing that's uh, great. And when you are in the team uh, and you are working with documentation that is this close to code, you're sitting among the developers, among these cavemen that I mentioned before. Of course, that's a joke, and we don't think that devs are cavemen. Is that on the record? <laughs> yes, okay, cool. Um, so then you are tempted to, hey, can I do a little bit more? Maybe can I save the world? No, not really. Maybe can I, uh, can I do some quality assurance? Why not? I mean, uh, we are down and dirty with the product. As Barbara mentioned, our product is, our project is developer oriented, our documentation is developer oriented, so uh, in our docs you see that the command line interface is a first class citizen. We don't really uh, document the user interface because, you know, the user interfa interface is basically a nice wrapper for, t for what go what's going on under the hood. So, um, with knowledge like this, we are often uh, treated a little bit different by the devs and they just say, hey, look, I have this new feature, it's great. Here's the pull request, uh, deploy Kima and try it on your own, okay? I will tell you a bit about it in like two hours. Try to figure it out, figure it out on your own, basing on the task description and basing on the cha changes in files that, that happened. And what are we left to do? We just do it, right? We just uh, fire the thing up, uh, we try to figure out how it's supposed to work and how it's supposed not to work. And we often, uh, as the person that is, that is a little bit closer to the end user, we are uh, often I able to identify uh, some uh, things that are maybe not the way they should be and sometimes to notice bugs. And we are, you know, with our limited uh, development experience, both of us uh, happen to uh, catch a bug or two and even fix it in the code, so we are very proud of ourselves. Uh, we don't really think that it's going to happen ever again, but it's a memory we cherish. And uh, <laughs> the last thing that is uh, really easy to do when you are at the very center of the development cycle is community management. And from our experience, uh, we can say, we both can say that the devs you know, they like working with code. Docs, nah. Community, why do we have to do that? Isn't there a dedicated community person? Well, there lo is. and behold, there is. It's <laughs> us. I mean, we like doing that. We like talking to people. We like, write, uh, we like writing in English. So it's not a problem for us when there are people interested in our, in our project who come to our Slack, which we invite you to. There will be a link at the very end of the presentation to our project Slack and these people do what? They don't want to hang out and you know uh, share memes, but we'd love yeah. that. Maybe we should create a dedicated <laughs> meme channel. I believe there is one. There, there is, is one? one. Okay. <laughs> so I'm not there? Come on. Um, instead they ask questions, they want to know things, they share their problems and they want these problems to be solved. So what we can do with our knowledge, with us being more of an information developer rather than just simply a technical writer, we have enough, enough knowledge to simple these problems, which are often uh, simple, to solve these problems, which are, which are often quite simple because people are, are often having the most problems when they are starting out with our project. Uh, we are able to uh, tell them what to do. We are able to answer their questions or at least point them, point them into the direction, in the direction of, the, of where the document, documentation that would, will help them solve the problem is. Because we have this kind of a bird's eye view on everything. We kind of know what's going on in the code in more or less of a detail and we have a really good overview of where all of the documentation is. So it's fun to help people and the devs are happy because they can focus on code. So there's that. And the final aspect, I mean, I mean the second one, <laughs> which is the final aspect of, of the community management thing, is the release notes which are, of course, a very important, in our opinion, way to communicate with the community that is around the project. Well, everybody wants to know what's in this new 1.8 release, right? And you can do it in a very stiff and boring way with just a simple enumeration of new features or bugs fix or whatever. Or you can do it our way, where we swore that we are not going to be as stiff and as boring as we could. So we are trying to dance this 
thin line between puns and real information every time we create a release notes. We take turns, so it's never the same style. Uh, but uh, the idea behind release notes in our project is this. We decided that it is up to the development teams to choose the features that they want to be highlighted on their own. So we ask them, we remind them, please, kindly, uh, let us know what features you want to have in the release notes by this and this date. Of course, they go past it tremendously, but you know that's a whole another thing. But when we have these summaries and these highlights, uh, what we do is we create an introduction uh, that is uh, more fun, a little bit uh, punny, uh, a little bit more le less stiff, I shall say. Uh, we uh, summarize everything that's new in the new release and then we proceed with the part uh, that's a little bit more technical and uh, describes the features that the developers give us that they want highlighted in more technical detail. And that's it. When, you, when it comes to us being parts of the team, I think it's a great thing to have. I mean, us being close to the team. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I, I also second that. Okay, so I believe that's it for a second part of our presentation. And this is our short summary and some takeaways for you. So you know now how the Docs is called approach more or less works in our project and that it actually works for us. And what are the benefits of it? So first of all, Docs released uh, with features make the docs always up to date and also it shortens the uh, development, the development, the documentation backlog a lot. Because sometimes when you work with a totally separate tool, it's like, yes, we're gonna devel to, to develop it right now, uh, meaning the features, and then the documentation will be like just a little bit, a little bit later, right? And here it's just like, okay, um, the features have to be accompanied by documentation right away. So. It's also like a help for us because we don't get our documentation task piling up, right? And then docs are processed and stored in the same terms as code. That makes them the same class citizens. We use the same processes to create docs and code. Uh, we work in context and the process itself is simplified rather than if we have like a separate tool that requires uh, different, completely different style of work, gathering input from the developers and then putting it into, into a separate tool, then waiting, then building and all of that. So here it's simplified and it also, as I said and as we mentioned, fosters the technical writer and developer mutual understanding. So one thing more is that they work on the same team. So it really um, also um, means a lot to the technical writers, meaning they know more about the topic, and also for the developers to uh, have the technical writers on their team to help them with the content and also to act as sort of information developers for them. So these are our benefits, and also we encourage you to become a Kima contributor if you want to. Uh, there is our website, so kimaproject.io, that's our website. Our naked docs are under uh, under docs, basically, in, in our GitHub repository. And you can also have a look at the website um, source code so you can then uh, know how we do it, what is the process of creating the website and the tools that we use. And of course, we encourage you to contact us. We have our dedicated Kima Slack channels. So just, if you feel like it, just contribute. And if enough of you show up, maybe we will create a meme channel that yes, actually I'm in. Yes. I would love yes. to be in one of Okay, so um, thank you guys a lot yeah, for listening it. to our presentation. That's it. But we welcome questions that we are trying to basically answer, and we have some. Yeah, and if you are shy, uh, we brought some t-shirts and some uh, Lego figurines that are related to our project, so that's a bonus if you have a question. But yeah. if you have a question and you are shy, then this is a good uh, motivation to ask a question. Okay, go ahead, please. Well, my question is from uh, well, uh, do you have points, uh, uh, meeting points where both documentation and uh, actually code are coming out of the same path? Like there are frameworks that generate code from uh, documentation from code, um, like or uh, 
well, of course, these, these things are there. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what, what I'm really interested in is uh, how to smoothly integrate that so that the nice documentation, which is written as documentation, mm -hmm. and these automatic generated stuff, how, how did they, they glue into each other so that you don't really see anymore which, which parts are auto generated, which parts are manually generated, so that, that it to create one flow, like like this other generation where you do an annotation in the code, mm -hmm. like what, what I could think of as well, tooling that, for instance, makes uh, some, some kind of a documentation out of configuration files, mm -hmm. if they follow up some, some, some styles, or if you, uh, maybe with some interimistic uh, language where you tell uh, how to and make they, this configuration mm -hmm. file a doc file, uh, a documentation file, and this then into the, the, the manual created stuff. I guess that, could you repeat the question for the recording? Okay, so uh, for the recording, I think that to sum up your question is how to integrate uh, things that are in code and make them automatically into documentation and how to uh, integrate that with manually created documentation. Yeah, so Correct? So that, so Correct that summary? it looks like one, one mm -hmm. thing that fits yeah. together and that's not two, two things. Okay, so that see, that's, <laughs> so that's a thing that we don't really do. We do not have any, uh, in our code, we have this approach where uh, the documentation is basically always uh, manually written, but the whole styling process and publishing process, this is automated. So there are no but but yes, it, uh, yeah, aside from the CRI, of okay. course. <laughs> uh, so there is not really, when it comes to the core product, there is not a place which is flagged like, hey, whenever this changes, please generate a new document. We don't really do that. So everything you see on our website is manually written by us or the developers. developers. However, there is one place that Barbara works with that has this approach? Yes, uh, that's our Kima CLI because we have our own CLI to you can use to work with Kima. So, like for the developers, it's just easier uh, to install it and and work with it. And the documentation for the CLI is based on what we have in the code. However, uh, all the flags and commands they are generated from the code. And we are just right now starting on integrating it with the manuals that we have. So probably I will have like a good answer to your question in, I don't know, two Next months. Next year. Next <laughs> year. Next time we're here, no. hopefully. <laughs> Okay. So uh, we are just starting to, to work on that because right now we have all the uh, all the documentation from the code generated into Markdown files and then obviously treated as uh, well as normal Markdown files. So they can be then um, rendered on the website, but uh, these are separate ones, and we want to add to the list of these commands that are basically auto generated. We want to add the whole documentation of the CLI, so that's the, that's the process that we are going <laughs> to figure out, I think, in one, two months tops. Yes. That's the reason why I'm asking. Yeah. I've never stumbled over, over something about this. Gave me a good feeling, like, uh, it either looked auto-generated, mm. not easy yeah. to understand, not nice looking, or it was... Manually written. Was manually written. Yeah, it doesn't make sense when you've got like a lot of like a list of commands. So basically, that's why we for a CLI we use the auto-generated uh, documentation, but we want to integrate it with more <laughs> CLI dedicated docs. So it's <coughs> gonna happen. It's gonna to happen. a certain extent, I would expect it's, it's everywhere it would make sense. When yes, you have, When you have the tooling to properly integrate it. It's yes. Good. If you auto-generate things and copying things in the mail and stuff, that's shit. Still, still, it's like with you know analog versus digital. I mean, there are all, there's always a group of people who will say that whatever the case is, whatever the application, analog is always better. So I guess I believe in that when it comes to the uh, documentation. So I'm a, an advocate of human written documentation. It's always, in my opinion, better than automatically generated one, even it, if it does takes it more have, work. Does it have to be the whole thing? Yeah. Probably not. Um, well, my, my feeling was that there are parts where it just is... Some mundane parts just work, like these commands. Where you yeah. yeah. can get a, rid of it. Okay. Concentrate on the rest where the human is doing it. Yeah. We'll move on to another question. So maybe but we'll you can always be give out the swag after yeah, we'll, our I'll presentation. Move. Okay, so yes. will you come to us after we, we're done? We'll give you the t-shirt and, and uh, other bonuses. Okay, yeah. so we have a second question here 
fourth row, Mr. with the scarf, yes. Um, do you recommend having a separate repository for the documentation because there's different processes for the, um, for the, the building and mm -hmm. the drawing, or do you just put it in the same repository? Basically, uh, this is the same. Yeah, so, <laughs> sorry, I have to repeat the question for the recording. So, do you recommend uh, having a separate repository for the documentation because of the different processes that there are uh, when it comes to the docs and the code? Actually, uh, it is as the same repository as most of the code. So, the, the entire project is structured so that, there, so that there are some parts of the code in different repositories, but the, uh, the meat and potatoes are in the same place where the docs are. It's just a different directory. And um, it's just basically when you have automated testing, it's uh, up to choosing what tests run on what pull requests. And I don't think that there is really a recommendation, but in our case, we wanted to have, as we mentioned in the presentation, the documentation as close to the code and basically on the same rights. So it was a natural decision for us to put the documentation in the exactly same repository as the main portion of the code. However, we pull the content for the website from different repositories because community, for example, comes from a different repository. Yeah. So the whole community tab, which was there, uh, basically comes from a different repository. Mm -hmm. So we true. have both, but when it comes to the like really content for the Kima website, the, the project itself, uh, the manuals and stuff, it comes from one repository. Yeah. Exactly. So sorry, you have to raise your hands again. Hi. Um, you mentioned you write the documentation while the developer develops the code. How do you um, interact? Do you, um, do you agree on certain specifics before the developer starts developing the code so you can write the documentation that fits? Mm -hmm. Is there any, any process you go through to make sure that the documentation then fits to the code that's maybe not yet written? Sure. Repeat the question. Okay. okay. Uh, are there any uh, processes that we have that ensure that uh, the documentation and the code are on the same page, so to say, uh, when we start to write a documentation, uh, code, uh, documentation for code that is just being developed? Would you like to answer or should I? No. Um, so it's all... We talk, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talk. We talk a lot. We, we try, try to be in the loop, as Barbara mentioned. So uh, depending on the developer, because uh, the, um, the flow of the implementation, it differs from person to person, from task to task. So what we do, we actively participate in planning uh, sessions. So we know uh, what features are going to be implemented in a given release cycle. So we have an overview of what's going to come with that feature, what's it, what it's going to do. And then it's up to us and the developer to talk it out and decide whether we can start uh, documenting the feature before it's even conceived or whether we should wait a bit because, let's see, we know that the developer is going to code a desk, but is the desk going to be this high or this low or is the desk going to be black or brown? So then we say, okay, so we don't know that yet. So let's wait, let's say, two or three days and give you some time to clear out the details of the implementation and once exchange. Yep. Yes. And that's why we are parts of the team. That that's being a part of the team makes it very easy because we are, you know, brothers in arms or sisters in arms. Yeah. And documentation driven development. We would love that. Oh, that would be awesome. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. Um okay. Okay, Barbara, choose the next question. Uh, I believe at the back. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I was wondering, do you, uh, do you employ any single sourcing or any reuse of content in your docs? Or mm -hmm. is everything just linear and written for, for each piece separately? You have like a library of modules. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Conditional logic. I think we should repeat the question for, for the recording. So, the question is, uh, if we employ any reusable content in our documentation. Okay, would you like to answer? Uh, so right now we don't, I believe. We, we just write everything like manually and, and we don't actually employ any reuse uh, strategies right now, but well, I think that it's, it's an open question, but. It, it depends how you, what do you understand as reuse strategy? Because yeah. Uh, we do not reuse uh, 
definitions of objects of custom resources whatever because these are this has to be they, they have to be written uh, for specific cases but I think where the reuse comes in is the fact that we have uh, document templates so there are yes, that's there true. are some document types that, that are generic enough uh, to be uh, for the templates to carry enough information that it's just basically take the template and fill in some details and then you have a ready to go document. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to know, but like, do you have uh, the same piece of content, like literally the same source markup content included multiple times? No, no we don't no. have that. We don't have a flag that's, let's say, let's use table and uh, this given idea of a table or a concept or a definition can be inserted wherever we want with a given marker or something. No, we don't do that. In so, this project. Yeah. so it's not like, for example, if you have documentation in a content, content management system, like for example, Exosoft, uh, then it allows you to have like this reuse pool and then you can just pull out from it and, and have it like in multiple pages. So we don't have it, no. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Without a CMS in a traditional sense, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. if you'd like to know a little bit more about it, I'd be happy to talk to you again. Yeah. Okay. We do okay. access code too, so. Okay, great. You might like <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Last question, I believe. Uh, yes. So, out of hundreds of available static site generators out there, why did you choose that? It was given to us like this uh, sacrificial lamb, and we loved it. We loved its puppy eyes. And no, I, I mean, it was uh, the decision of the of the team that worked on the website. That was Lukas Gudnitski. Yes, <laughs> you know the guy. Um, and uh, it was fast enough, agile enough, it was uh, prone to changes that were that had to be made in order to suit our needs. It was flexible enough, I'd say, uh, that they chose it. And it works great, we don't really have any problems with yeah. with that. And we also have uh, a group of people that really know the ins and outs of Gatsby, so they can work it. Yeah. Okay. Do we have time for any more questions, or yeah. should we finish? I, I don't know if no. we have many more swag, but we can. Uh, we have five minutes, so we can. We can. We can take yeah. one or two questions, depending on. Yeah, length. because we've got like only five T-shirts, but yeah. I was just curious when you. So you mentioned you'd use Markdown mm -hmm. as the source for all of your documents. Yes. Is there, what was the motivation for choosing Markdown as the format for the docs? It's easy uh, to use. No, I think it's close. Enough. It's close enough. Okay, cool. Uh, so it's easy enough. Uh, who of you works with Markdown? Yeah, so can, can you all, who, who thinks Markdown is easy to use? Who of you thinks of, that Markdown is easy to use? Yeah, so you see, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very visual uh, Markdown language. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, brain fart. Uh, when it comes to formatting, uh, and it's basically, it's foolproof, I'd say. <laughs> There, there's a very uh, low uh, learning curve, so we thought that if we are open to contributions, we shouldn't really employ any systems that are uh, difficult to use for people from the outside. You don't really have to have a doctorate in using GitHub on open source projects to uh, see our docs and see, hey, this formatting is screwed up, I'd like to create a pull request and fix it for you because I just noticed it sitting on the toilet and looking through your website, right? So you can do that in a matter of minutes if you Google uh, Markdown basics. So we have very few custom implementations, but you don't really have to know about them to write documents for our website. I think that it's, yeah, it's also easy to source, right? So basically you can render it on the website. I believe that since in our company there are like a lot of different documentation teams and they work with different solutions. So we work uh, using Markdown, GitHub, people use CMS, so it's really different. People use Confluence and, and basically it's really also easy for them, for example, to take Markdown and put it in the CMS. Uh, so I think that's also the, 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 you know, multiple ways you can use it. Yep. And just to follow up, do you think that using Markdown brings drive-by contributions to your project? Do you, or do you get a lot of drive-by contributions to your docs? Um, so, <laughs> yeah, the con contributions, there could always be more. more we, yeah. we would love people to, to come and, and contribute to our docs more, even people from uh, within our company. 
uh, we are still a you know year and a half with this many great open source projects uh, out in the wild. We're still a young and relatively small project, but we are happy with the number of contributions. And what makes us even happier is the fact that when people finally decide to contribute, they don't really have uh, a lot of problems with uh, getting to what they need to do. I guess I'm going to rephrase it. So do you have people who contribute continually, the, pe the same people who mm -hmm. contribute, keep contributing? Or is it people who will do like little one-off things? Like, yeah, oh, this like was, it's... This Wrong mm -hmm. uh, at this point, uh, we don't really have uh, like constant contributors. We like these drive-by contributions, as you said, uh, are more a thing right now. And I believe you had a question, right? Oh, I'll probably just ask you after. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Cool. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Okay. I think that's gonna be because people are queuing. So oh yeah. 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 I think we Let's have wrap finished. it up. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much.